So thank you, Susan, for that introduction. So we have been here since April of 2013. So uh, we've been here in Las Vegas offering all the services that we offer from Cleveland uh, here in Las Vegas in terms of urology. So it's, it's a good addition to neurology. And we'll talk about some of the overlaps that we have between urology and uh, neurology. So without further ado, let's start. So uh, the, the, the age old question is how do we stay older and healthier? So typically uh, we don't really know how to do that yet. We are trying to figure that out. But uh, by definition, the geriatric population is anybody who's over the age of 65. So I put this slide in because I wanted to kind of describe how we've kind of advanced in a medical standpoint from if you look at the eight ancient Greek life expectancy from birth, it was about 20. That was the average life expectancy. And then up to 1776, so the foundation of our, our great nation, it was only about 23 at that time. So we hadn't come very far from the ancient time period to 1776. But then, if you look up to about 1900, it went to 47. And then most recent data we have is, this is the highest that it's ever been, 2012, 78.8. So this is the average age. And I put the maximum, I looked it up in the Guinness Book of World Records. It's 122 years old. And does anybody want to take a guess where uh, they're located, where she lives? It's a female. And where she lives? No. She, that's 119. <laughs> so she actually lives in France. <laughs> I thought it was Okinawa, too. But yeah, so Okinawa has the largest number of elderly above 100 concentrated in the entire world. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's interesting. Is that their wine? That's it's the wine. And snorkeling, and, and snorkeling. I was in the Navy. I was stationed in Okinawa. And some of the most beautiful snorkeling is, is in Okinawa. And, and people, beautiful people, too. So anyway. Um, Increased longevity is basically because our living conditions have improved and our health care has improved. So sequentially and major diseases have been eradicated um, from 1900 onward. So, and 13% um, of the U.S. population to date is above the age of 65. So this is a huge number of, of uh, individuals. And aging, we have a couple of different theories of why it happened. So, the first thing is just wear and tear, just like a car or a phone or a video camera. So cells that run our entire body, they're damaged by the toxins that are around us and what we eat. So until recently, we haven't really focused on what we eat. We've had this boom of fast food, and everybody loves fast food because it tastes good. It has a lot of salt in it. But it, it's damaged our cells, and it's made us have, you know, tons of diseases that we don't like. So we're slowly learning more and more about eating better and um, feeding ourselves more healthier food. And we know that a lot of the cells are damaged from that. And the environment. So the more pollution that we have, the more that we you know, use cell phones and all this technology that we have, it's creating problems in our environment and causing issues. So that's the wear and tear theory. Older individuals are more susceptible to physiological stresses because they can't repair the cellular uh, wear and tear. So as we get older, as we age, then the stresses on our body, things are becoming weaker. So like the car, the muffler on a 1980 car is going to not be, do so well as a car that's 2013, for example. So the same thing is our body needs to continuously repair ourselves to get healthy and as we get older, these are, are, are unable to be fixed. The second big uh, theory that we have is called a neuroendocrine. And that's just a big uh, word for the hormones that circulate through our body. And what happens is, so these are hormones like testosterone, estrogen. They decrease over time. And these hormones are what keep, uh, keep us healthy. They give us energy. They allow, they keep, they're kind of like the, um, the balance in our body. And as the hormones go down, you know, there has to be a balance. And if we don't have enough hormones, then our bodies get tired, and we get weak, and then we age. So that's why we have alteration. 
So primary aging is defined as universal changes occurring uh, with age that are not caused by the disease or not caused by disease or environmental influences. And then secondary aging, so these are the things that I was talking about. That's d disease processes from the environment, smoking, and then exposure to UV radiation. So there's a difference between primary and secondary aging. So I put this in here because Number one, I'm doing this talk here at, at the Center for Brain Health, so this is kind of a very in line with um, w all the research and all the patient care that goes on here. And I found it to be very interesting. So our cognitive function, this is just our day-to-day -day thinking and our function, it's all run by the cerebrocortical system. And this kind of, all the studies have shown that we have a decline in our cognitive function just merely by our age. So by age 65 to 70, there is a 1 to 2 percent decline, natural decline of the cerebrocortical system, all the cognitive functions. So thinking, activities, everything we do, even knowing when to go to the bathroom, for example. By 70 to 75, it goes down to about 5 percent. And then as you can see, it progressively gets worse. So over the age of 100, 70 to 85 percent of your cognitive functions so normal thinking normal behavior is gone so it's very, it's very interesting and um, 40 percent of 80 I put this in here too because we have a lot of standardized tests to measure our cognitive function and you know we do a lot of those tests here but 40 percent of 80 year olds or above show cognitive decline that's not measurable there's no way that we can even measure it on any test that we have so it's quite interesting um, because most of the tests that we do are memory-based tests. So many of these, this cognitive decline is something that we don't even recognize. So I put this in here because I think it's important to realize that just because somebody says, hey, you're forgetting something and you don't think so, there may be something else going on that we're not able to diagnose or we're not able to recognize. Do we have any questions about that? Um, so I probably just misunderstood you. But that says the percentage of people who have moderate to severe d dementia, whereas I thought you were saying, can you say what you said again? Because it so, just doesn't match what I so, see up there. I see the percentages. Yeah, so the, I'm, the meaning of what you're saying, I don't understand. Yeah, so the question was um, just in correlation with what the slide says. So pre prevalence of moderate to severe dementia. So what I did was... I just said that this is a decline in cognitive function. So I equate that to be the same as dementia. Okay. So moderate to, right. so, so saying, when you have a decline in your cognitive function, to me that equals some, for, some, some form of moderate dementia or, or okay. I right. mean, they, I, they, they went to severe. I don't think this is severe dementia. That's in my I'm personal sure. opinion, I don't think so. Decline just normal cognitive decline. Dementia. Normal cognitive decline, which is equal to some sort of dementia, according to this study. That's what they're saying. But I don't think that's necessarily true. As we know, you can have a mild dementia and be perfectly functional, right? I mean, we've proven that here at, at our Center for Brain Health. This is what we do. This is what the research is all about. So I don't necessarily agree with that, but I think the study really looked at how much cognitive decline is there over time as we age? And then they equated that to development of moderate dementia or severe dementia, if that makes sense. Okay. So, I know it's not Question the most clear thing. It does now, but it won't five years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you question. Yes, go ahead. Question from Karan? Okay. Yeah, you talk about the standardized test to, uh, that we can take to see whether we have evidence of uh, memory loss. Is there any way to access these type of tests online? I, I, and take it online? Yeah, the question was about the memory-based tests that can show your cognitive function. I'm actually not co familiar with that the test itself because that would be more of a neurology. I would have to talk to some of my colleagues here and get back to you about that. 
Is that okay if I get back to you on that? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so this is the this is just came out this week actually, and um, it was on. I just saw it when I was preparing this talk uh, this weekend, and. Um, so basically, I read the article because it was right in line with my talk, and they were talking about how Novartis has now thought, you looked at an old drug that we've been using for years in mice and found that they're actually live, the mice are living longer. It's called rapamycin. So then they wrote it up. But up to date right now, we have nothing that can extend our lives that we know of. Anti-aging drug does not exist. So we don't have it. So let's talk about the golden years and how they relate to my specialty, which is urology. So let me come back to what I know uh, more. So the, the bladder ages over time. And this, in men, is related to prostatic enlargement. So the first thing people think about when men get older is we think about the prostate. But there's so many other things that, that go with that. So we look at the prostate, and then there's also the bladder. So the prostate and the bladder are very intimately involved. And so that ages over time. The tendency to, to have more water production at night, and that leads to getting up uh, at night to urinate a lot. And that's not just, that doesn't just happen with women, that happens with men, and that can be related to your bladder or your prostate. So that's something that we're gonna talk about. Atherosclerosis of the heart and all the blood vessels of our body also affect the, the, the vessels that go to our erectile organs. So that's for men and for women. So then you can have erectile dysfunction or loss of sexual drive. So that's very important to talk about. Uh, hormonal alteration. So I talked about how hormones go down as we age. So we get impotence as a result of that, which is different from the vascular disease. And then you can also have atrophic vaginitis, and that leads to recurrent bladder infections, urinary tract infections, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole list of things that can happen as we enter those golden years. So first thing I'm going to talk about, because everybody loves talking about the prostate, is the prostate. So why do, why do I have a prostate? So I thought about it, and I, I, I said to myself, I said, why? So it really doesn't do much. So it's a male exocrine organ, so which means that it secretes fluid that's just mixed with semen and then it comes out. But quite honestly, you don't need it. And it may be one of those things that over time we may never, we may not have it. It may evolutionarily be removed. And the other problem was, and they say that God was a urologist because it constantly enlarges <laughs> as we age. So it, it just continuously grows. And this is not a cancer type of growth. It's a completely benign or non-cancerous type of growth. Just enlarges over time. And then the other problem is that all urine has to travel through the prostate. It has no choice. Urethra. And yeah, it has to travel through the prostate, the urethra to get to the urethra. It has to travel through the prostate to come out. So right here. So all the, the urine is here in the bladder and then it has to travel through this channel to come out in men. So you're, unless you have another kind of tube or some other way to get the urine out, you ha you're stuck. And this is why we ha there are all these problems. So here's kind of a better picture of it. So the bladder is just a big muscle, and then the urine collects in it, and then I'm going to talk about the, the way we urinate in a couple of minutes, the way, the, the pathways that we use. But anyway, this is just kind of a simple diagram. So urine, once the bladder fills up, has to travel through the prostate and come out. Now when the prostate becomes enlarged, what happens is it, try, it kind of squeezes that hose, the channel in between, and then urine starts to collect, and urine doesn't come out, and then you have to push it out, and then you get up a lot more often to go, and then you don't go, and then it really sucks. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, there's no better way to put it. <laughs> and so, I, and honestly, this is, this is the dilemma that we have, you know, what to do after this happens. So does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yes, Any questions about, this is just kind of the normal anatomy and then what happens when it enlarges. And the other thing that's worth noticing is that it also tends to grow inside, not just, it tends to grow into the bladder. And then the other thing I want to mention is since the bladder is just a muscle, 
it has to squeeze to get all the urine out. So as we get golden, the muscle gets weaker, but it has to squeeze, it's, it's required to squeeze more. So a weaker muscle is squeezing harder. So that doesn't really, that's not gonna work very well either. So see how it becomes thickened? Mm -hmm. So that's why we, we have the challenge of dealing with not only the prostate, but also the muscle of the bladder. So that's why I put this picture up. Oh yeah, go ahead. You had said that it's not a, a cancer though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the question is, yeah, the question is about the enlargement of the actual prostate. So you can have cancer, but most of the time cancer doesn't cause enlargement like this. This is the normal gland. So it's, a, it's just a big gland, just like uh, the thyroid gland, for example. Just kind of creates hormones. And the, the reason, the problem is, as we continue to produce testosterone in our body, in combination with some other factors, the prostate continues to grow normally and it's not cancerous. When you say it squeezes it, I'm well acquainted with that. If you don't get to the bathroom, you're gonna need the pens or, yes. or a rubber sheet underneath you because when that happens to me, which is frequently, uh, I literally have to be on four, four feet, not two. Mm -hmm. So it is a very compelling and, and very, very annoying mm -hmm. and embarrassing. Luckily, I still have good bladder control, so I don't. I sleep through the night. Yeah. But I usually get a couple of interruptions, which kind of ruins my sleep. I'm well acquainted with this garbage. Now I'm going to talk about. So, I'm going to. I, well I want acquainted. to see if it's the next one. It's coming up, though. I'm going to talk about why there is a little bit. Of, there can be a little bit of leakage, if you don't make it quite in time. I'll talk about that. Oh yeah, I, I get that too. Yeah. But what I found out that you do for it, you squeeze your friend at the end. And that stops it. Well, I'm telling you, I'm yeah. telling you the truth. You know, my grandmother used to say, when you were real young, children should be seen and not heard. Well, at 66, I should be heard. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Since it's a muscle and you can strengthen other muscles, is there a way to strengthen the bladder muscle? So we've. Th That's a very good question. So the question was, how do you strengthen the bladder muscle? So the, there are two kinds of muscles in our body. There's smooth muscle and there's striated muscle. So the only muscle that we can control voluntarily is striated muscle, which is like our biceps. And so we cannot control our smooth muscle at all. It, and then when I talk about the nerve pathways to the bladder, you'll see it's completely controlled involuntarily. That's why you're weak. That's another reason. So basically, there's no way we can control. But, a lot of people are probably familiar with Kegel exercises. And Kegel exercises, they focus on the muscle that we have right here. It's called the sphincter. So there are two muscles here. And basically, that's the only part of our urinary system that's our you know, striated muscle. And that's the only thing. So that's why we have Kegel exercises. And they can stop that problem? It won't. <laughs> because what happens is in men, the prostate causes the striated, that sphincter to yeah, it go puts bust. pressure on it. Yeah, it puts a lot of pressure yeah, on it. Makes and it, it goes uh, bust, basically. Do what it doesn't want to do. Yeah. So this is also always a very good slide because it <laughs> explains a lot about. <clears throat> so who cares if it enlarges? Because we already talked about it not being cancer, right? So if it's not cancer, who cares? That's not necessarily too, be true because, our, like our friend mentioned here, there's increased frequency. We have a lot more urgency. There's painful urination. At night, the, you urinate more. The stream becomes weaker because, you know, it used to be a garden hose. You used to be able to write your name in the snow. But now, <laughs> you're lucky if there, you get a couple of drops sometimes. So there's hesitancy. So this is normal. You're not alone. And that's why I bring this up. And it's good that you say because you're not alone. Well, the stream could be somewhat normal. But like I say, the urgency is like, you ain't going to ignore it. It's yeah. just that not going to happen. You can't. You, you're going to move like a bullet, you know, to get to where you have to go to, to avoid yeah. it. So then we talk about um, there's some dribbling, incomplete voiding, which is basically leaving some urine in your bladder. Right. They, they test you for that at the yeah, hospital. We, we test do, that, yeah. When I go in, it's sort of like having a sort of Damocles. <laughs> I keep going back and back, and it's sort of like they're waiting to give me the bad news. 
And then the last thing I want to talk about is if you can't empty your bladder completely, then sometimes you leak around it. So the bladder remains full, but then the urine kind of leaks around it, and that's kind of like a pop-off valve. So we'll, that's very in more severe cases. That's so embarrassing, you know, especially when you're you were accustomed to having full control. Yeah. Um, so anyway, usually what we can do, I wasn't going to go talk about too much in detail about how to manage it, uh, more about talking about what to, you know, about the, kind of the, to understand the physiology behind it. But basically what we do is we can give medication to shrink the prostate and to help urinate better. Uh, we can do surgery on the prostate, which helps open up that channel and allows the urine to flow smoothly. Well, you still have to think about your sphincter. Your sphincter, over time, has weakened. So sometimes there's leakage of urine after that, which can come back over time with exercises. Uh, and then if we can't do anything, then we think about passing a catheter yourself in order to, op to empty your bladder to relieve that pressure and to make you feel better. If, I just wanted to talk quickly about prostate cancer because we do treat that a lot in our practice. Uh, just a quick slide about it so that we're all acquainted uh, on the same page. So it's the second most common uh, cause of cancer deaths, about 11% in males. It's right behind a lung and bronchus, which is the most common cancer in, in the country. Um, the high risk groups, so these are the ones that we kind of focus on, in on, but we target in on our first degree family members that may have had prostate cancer, uh, a patient who is African American or somebody who uh, has had prostate cancer in the past that we're kind of following and that can become worse over time. The symptoms, most of the time you don't feel it at all. You don't know at all that you have it. It's one of the uh, most, it's very commonly known as the silent cancer that continues to grow until you actually check for it. If it becomes more advanced, then it moves into the bones and then you can have blood in the urine, you can have weakness, you can have weight loss. A lot of times what we'll find is somebody will fall and, and undergo a fracture and we find out that it's related to the actual prostate cancer spreading from that prostate to the bones. So it's always important to know that. The other thing that we do is a rectal examination and then during that time we'll be able to find uh, if there is a nodule or some portion that's uh, abnormal and then we would investigate that. So I, I was going to do uh, the next thing I was going to talk about is the PSA test. So these two kind of go hand in hand. There's always a lot of controversy about PSA. Uh, should we get it? Should we not? The main thing about PSA is it's called prostate-specific antigen, and it's a blood test that many of you, you guys have probably had. And basically it's specific to the prostate, but it's not particularly specific to cancer. So we can't put all of our faith in it. <clears throat> so sometimes that enlargement of the prostate that we saw in the previous slide, that can cause an elevation of this blood test. Infection of the urine can cause it. Infection of the prostate itself, so cystitis or prostatitis or infections, they can cause the PSA level to go up. Any kind of instrumentation, so if you have to have a catheter or you have retention of urine, any problem down there can cause this lab test to go up. So we don't particularly put all of our stock in this blood test alone. But we do use it in conjunction with those risk factors that I talked about and also with the rectal examination. So it's important to have all the pieces of information before we start looking for prostate cancer. Go ahead, sir. Are you saying that the PSA number is related directly to the mass of the prostate? It can, it, it can be, yes. And, it, and however that mass got created, it, whether normally or through cancer. It'll cause that number. Reach. Yeah, so what the question was, will the PSA test go up if the mass of the prostate gets larger? And th the answer is yes, it will. Ah. So you have to use the number very carefully, along with the size of your prostate, along with any of the other symptoms, risk factors. If your brother had prostate cancer, then that puts you at a much higher risk than somebody who doesn't, for example. So we have to, this is why you have to really consult with the physician. And then I was going to put this, this is the next slide. So are, is anybody next? So the basic, for the blood test, let's line up, let's get it done. So basically our newest recommendations are, because it's so not, so not specific, so if you have no family history 
or no prior history of any prostate problems or elevation of this prostate specific antigen, this blood test, then we don't screen anymore after the age of 70. So by 70, if everything is normal and you don't have any family history, then this is what we do. We, we don't screen the blood test anymore because we found that we're picking up abnormal values and do it, acting upon them and finding no cancer. So this is very important. This is the newest recommendation and family guy is, he's not 70 yet. <laughs> okay, so I was gonna shift, basically what I'm trying to say, it's a lot of, it's a lot of pathways in order to urinate. So basically I'm gonna describe it to you in a couple of sentences. So the, our bladder fills up and then what happens is it sends a message all the way up to our brain, the pontine, the pontine storage center. So that cerebral pontine center basically then tells, goes back down the spinal cord and back to that sphincter that I was talking about and tells the sphincter to relax. So be, since we have two sphincters, one sphincter relaxes and then the one we control is the one that we hold on to. So then finally, your body says, hey, you need to go. Then we say, oh, we can't go yet, I'm not in the bathroom. So we hold that sphincter, and then we run to the bathroom, and then we say, go ahead. So the other sphincter is already ready to go, and then you relax the one that you control, and then we urinate. So this is how it works. So it's very complicated, and, and it's interesting how, so stretching that bladder muscle, just in and of itself cannot cause the release of urine. That pathway, that signal has to go all the way to the brain and then come back down and say it's time to urinate. So it takes quite some time before this happens. Now, if there are any diseases that affect the, the midstream of the brain, then that will affect your urination. So for example, when we see some stroke patients, they are unable to process this information. Their bladder will fill up but since the, the pathway doesn't make it all the way to the brain or it makes it there but then does not come back down, some of these patients are unable to urinate on their own. And it's all, all because everything happens up top in our brain. Nothing happens down below as we seem, as it seems. So this helps understand a little bit better, right? It's really, it's kind of cool how this works. So, when we relax our sphincter, then the bladder squeezes. So uh, the other thing that's interesting here is our, our sphincter has to open up. So our brain says, okay, go ahead, urinate. I'm, I'm in the right location, let's do it. Then you, this muscle doesn't, you, we don't squeeze the muscle of the bladder. The brain does that for us. So there's another pathway that goes, once this relaxes, that's what the, over here on the other side. Once we say, open it up, let it out, then there's another pathway that goes up to the top and then the brain says, okay, squeeze the bladder muscle. We cannot control our bladder at all, the muscle of the bladder. Very interesting. Sir? Yes, sir. The, the muscle we can control uh, through uh, doing kegels, making stronger. We're just trying to overcome the strength of the bladder, right? That's exactly right. And if we had not done that through life work, then that secondary sphincter is weak and we, there's no... That's choice. exactly right. So I'll repeat that. So basically what, uh, what our friend is saying here is that that muscle that we control is trying to overcome the pressure of your bladder. And that's exactly correct. So what happens is many people don't focus on Kegel. Women do because they've been taught at early on to, in order to control your urine, you have to work on this muscle, but men do not. And so that's why many men, after their prostate becomes enlarged, have leakage, because this muscle has not been trained. So that's a very good point. So to pee or not to pee. So these are the things that happen. So we have frequency. So this is just a, kind of the definitions of what we're going to go through when it related to urination. So frequency of urination, that's the need to go often. Urgency is the sensation to go, so you feel like you have to go. And then what happens is either you lose some urine on the way there, or when you get there, there's nothing that comes out, or there's some fear that you don't know what's going on. So, but there's a feeling that you have to go, but you don't, it doesn't follow up with anything. Nocturia means when you just urinate a lot at night. 
or urinating at night at all. Incontinence is just leakage of urine um, involuntarily. So you're just sitting here and then all of a sudden something comes out. So frequency and urgency, we couple that together and we call that overactive bladder. And what overactive bladder is, remember we talked about how that we can't control the bladder. So basically the bladder muscle is acting on its own and it's overactive and it's doing this. And basically it causes you to go to the bathroom more often and it causes you to have that urgency, that feeling that you have to go. But when you get there, there's nothing there because you just went 10 minutes ago. So that's what happens here. See, this is, these little lines here are, is the bladder acting on its own. And like we discussed, we can't control that. So what we do is we give medication that may help calm down the muscle of the bladder. So you're not alone though, uh, and this is men and women. So I put this slide up because traditionally we thought that only women had overactive bladder. But recent studies have shown that up to 30% of men, so 40% of women and 30% of men. So that's not very far behind. So because now we're relating prosthetic problems to overactive bladder. These are, new, these are new concepts over the last five years that we're learning. So 33 million people in the US have overactive bladder, and this is just that frequency and the urgency to urinate, and it can be up to 30% uh, in men and 40% in women. So treatment, a lot of the treatments are behavior modification. So, you know, those are when you work on the Kegel exercises, the strengthening exercises, um, medication, like we talked about, uh, will also help control that muscle. And then you need to talk to a specialist, so. Go ahead. So the medications are, also, are uh, most commonly anti, the medications, the question was the medications for overactive bladder. So we have a range of medications, but the main family of medications are called anticholinergic. So this first started with um, uh, ditropan, which is the most common one. The problem is they have side effects. Yeah, they have side effects. And there's a whole slew that have come afterwards that have less side effects, but they still have the side effects. So ditropan, detrol, vesicare, sanctuary, these are all some of the names that are there, but it has to be personalized. And then the most common side effect is dry mouth and constipation, so ones that are not very, very fun. So we have to be very careful when we um, think about how to treat overactive bladder. And every patient is different, every situation is different. Um, but commonly, those are the medications that we use. Okay. Okay, so I was going to move on to the next one, is, which is nocturia, or why do we pee at night? So this is not just a urologic problem, because it can actually, the number one cause of peeing at night, when I was doing some research, is actually congestive heart failure. So as we become golden and we age, many people have congestive heart failure. So that's one of the reasons why we get up to, our body naturally has to clear some of the fluid that's around the heart. And then that leads to swelling of the legs that many people have, and that causes you to urinate more often. So it's not necessarily just an overactive bladder. So kind of interesting information. Obstructive sleep apnea, this is when your breathing stops during the night that can cause you to urinate more because that causes you to retain fluid in your legs and then your body naturally reflexively says, I need to get rid of some of this fluid and then the, the, it causes you to get up at night to urinate. Many drugs, this is another thing that we don't talk about very often, a lot of, a lot of drugs have side effects. Lot, you know, there's like 1,500 things listed, nobody reads that stuff. <laughs> yeah, even I, I, nobody reads that stuff. So diuretics, water pills, cardiac drugs, there's an excessive number of drugs that can cause you to, to urinate at night. One of the things we talk about is drinking too much at night before you go to bed. So that can cause you to urinate more frequently at night. So a lot of times we do fluid restriction in the evening. So I basically put this up here because there are a lot of reasons why we urinate at night. It's not just a bladder problem. And then the other thing is, um, Alcohol at night will also cause you to urinate more. So the question is, who cares when I pee? So, <laughs> so the reason why at night can be a problem, especially in the golden, in the golden time period, is because 
when you get up at night, it's usually dark and you tend to fall. So in 2011, 22,000 people, almost 23,000 people died just from falling. So there's an increased mortality risk if you were to get up at night and you fell, you could die. And this is important. And one out of three patients over the age of 65 fall every year. So this is very important. And then I found this is also, I learned a lot when I did this lecture. So <clears throat> five to 10% per of patients who have a, a hip fracture, they die within a month. Five to 10% of patients, because our body, as I said, we age, our, the, our cellular repair system is not the same. So this is, this is important stuff. So if you get up at night to urinate, you have to make sure you don't fall. You have to make sure you, everything is, you have a well-lit situation. You know, it's nice and uh, clear, it's open. Um, and then 20 to 30% die within one year. So this is very important stuff. <clears throat> and then the last thing I put on here is, if you survive the fall, 50% 50, 50 of those um, who had a hip fracture who were living independently end up not living independently. So it's very important to recognize this. So it does matter when you pee. <clears throat> the last thing I was going to talk about from the urination is why do I leak? So I think we talked about some of it already. So it's estimated that between 15 to 35 percent of, of uh, individuals in the United States over the age of 60 have some type of leakage of urine. So you're not alone. And basically, <clears throat> some of the risk factors, that's men and women, some of the risk factors are any kind of hysterectomy or pelvic surgery, obesity, any kind of stroke, as we talked about, can cause urination problems, uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, or uh, CHF, um, that causes it, diminished gait, this is not moving around so much, and just poor overall health. So that means that <clears throat> anything can cause you to leak anything. And like I said, up to 35% of people do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you're, this is just kind of a, a summary of it. 50% of women have some kind of incontinent leakage of urine at some point in time. This could be after childbirth. This could be at any time after a hysterectomy. And then out of those, 33% of women have regular leakage of urine. Um, and it's obviously more in females than males. And the other interesting thing here is that 50% of nursing home residents have some kind of leakage of urine. Uh, and about one and a half million Americans live there in nursing homes. Um, and basically, sometimes urinary leakage can cause sacral ulcers and other wound problems. And then that causes them to be admitted in the nursing home. So oftentimes, this is a, a factor for placement in um, a nursing home. So the other reason I put this in there is because a lot of times I see uh, people in my office and they said, oh, I w I've been leaking for 10 years. I just thought that was the way it was going to be, or I've had overactive bladder for such a long period of time. But it doesn't have to be that way. There are a lot of treatment strategies that we can develop that can make it better or then let us tell you that this is going to be the way it is. But don't make that decision on your own because there's some things we can do, and then it can be fatal. So, so medical causes for your leakage, sometimes if you have a urinary tract infection. So any kind of infection, you start leaking, that's something that we need to know about, okay? And then we talked about prostate trouble. <clears throat> I mentioned this, constipation, because it's, it's common. Constipation is common as we get older and it's very uncomfortable and because of the location of the constipation and the location of the bladder, they are related. So if you have constipation, sometimes you can have leakage and sometimes we can treat both together and get a successful result. So it's important. Um, and then side effects of medication, that's something that we would review all the medications and see if that's something that is related. Um, I wanted to talk, I put this slide in there because <clears throat> dementia and leakage, I think that kind of goes along with the, what we have here at, at, at uh, Center for Brain Health. So 
a lot of times uh, with some dementia there can be leakage of urine and, and basically not being able to re react quickly enough to the sensation to use the toilet, to need to use the toilet can cause leakage, failure to make it there on the time uh, right away that you need to go and that can cause um, leakage of urine. That could also be related to mobility issues such as arthritis, um, previous hip fracture or something like that. Uh, also not being able to communicate that to somebody, you know, to your caretaker or somebody that's with you. Not being able to tell you that I need to go to the bathroom. So this is important. Um, inability to recognize uh, the location of the bathroom or somebody becomes confused of their surroundings. This is very important. Um, and many times they're not even aware that, that this is even a, a, a problem, so it won't be brought to anybody's attention. Um, urinating in inappropriate locations, um, not understanding the, pr up the prompts, um, and, and the list just goes on. I just put it in there so that it's kind of something that I, I like to bring to our attention that we should recognize this, that the, it can be related. Treatment, as I mentioned, it's mostly behavioral, adjusting fluids, adjusting the kinds of fluids, um, strategies when you have the urgency, strengthening that muscle through Kegel exercises. There are new exercises now called Janet exercises, which are also very good. Um, bladder irritants, so caffeine, spicy foods, alcohol, they cause a lot of problems with the bladder. Everything that we put in our body eventually gets excreted either through the stool or the urine. And a lot of times we don't even realize, but a lot of this stuff comes out through our urine, irritates the lining of our bladder, and causes us to go more often, causes us to uh, have leakage of urine, and so on and so forth. And then exercises. <clears throat> yeah, this was just the area of the brain where, that I was talking about prior. This is a little detailed. But basically, all of our urination comes from the brain. So that's why I put this in there. And then I wanted, the last thing I was going to talk about was uh, Parkinson's uh, disease and the bladder. So the most common problem, because I know we, have, we do a lot of research on that here, the most common issue with Parkinson's and bladder is the difficulty to hold the urine. So this is a common, this is what we found to be the common problem with it. And the brain's control of that sphincter is disturbed just because the location of where uh, all of our urination starts from, that location is disturbed. So that controls the sphincter as well. So the bladder may become overactive and may empty even when there's just a small amount of urine present. So that leads to frequency of urination, which includes at night. So you kind of get where I'm going with this. So the results are urgency, frequency, incontinence, and then repeated nighttime urination. Um, the second most common problem is not being able to get it all out. And this is irrespective of a big prostate, which they probably have too, in a male. So it can be caused by the sphincter wanting to close when the bladder is ready to empty. So there's not a good coordination between the brain and the sphincter when it gets the signal that it's time to go. So that may cause the, you know, the bladder to hold more urine in. So you have a weak urinary stream, there can be some leakage around it. It's the same thing. Oh, I was going to put kidney stones. Is anybody interested in kidney stones? <laughs> That's a lot of what we do. And as we get older, that, the, the pain and the infection is also much worse too. So. <laughs> And the elderly are affected differently. And basically, the only way to prevent it, typically, is to increase your fluid intake. Uh, you know, drink more fluid, drink more water. Uh, know that if there's any problems, you get it checked out right away. It's not something that you want to. Yes, sir. One question quickly. Um, does the intake of water uh, affect the prostate profoundly? Not directly. but. If you have to urinate more frequently, yeah, you would urinate more frequently. So it's not good if you're not drinking enough for the prostate as well. Oh, you're talking about directly related to in the prostate? In any way. Not necessarily. No, no, I wouldn't say that's related. That's it. Um, go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, let me get there. 
So like a, so like this slide here. So basically, no fluid at night. R limit the amount of fluid that you have at night. The other thing we talk about is a like a diary. So I, we would write down the kinds of fluids that you you take in, what time, and then also correlate that with how many times you go to the bathroom, how many times um, that we you know everything changed based on what kind of fluids we're taking in. That's also related to caffeine. So caffeine is a big one um, that causes problems. Spicy foods, as I mentioned, alcohol is another big one. So those are the three big offenders. So those are the behavioral modifications, yeah, typically. And then, then we have the pelvic floor exercises, which is combined with the behavioral therapy. So I'll go ahead, ma'am. I understand there's a shot That's part of the biofeedback and the peripheral tibial nerve stimulation. What you're describing is peripheral. So she was, the question was the shot that, it's, it's a needle, but it's a shot for overactive bladder. So basically what it is is that we've found that one of the nerves, because it's related to up here, if you stimulate a nerve, your tibial nerve, that basically that causes a reaction up in your brain in that voiding center, in that urination center, to, to relax, so that in case, instead of your bladder doing this, it's relaxed. Is it hmm. successful? It is, it's about 33% successful, yeah. It's not for everybody, it doesn't work for everybody, yeah. It's about 33%. It's not dangerous to take no. no, it's not a shot. So actually what it is, is it's a small needle that you put in there 12 weeks, and then it, you, you turn on like a TENS unit, and it stimulates the nerve. You basically shock the nerve. You send electrical current into this nerve, and then that travels up to the brain and then causes that area to relax. It, it's, it's fairly tolerable. It's not very painful. But I don't know if it works on everybody. Like I said, I think our data is about 30, 33%. So it's not for everybody. This is a very individualized treatment because it affects everybody to completely differently and not and usually not one thing alone it has to be kind of a multi-modality so we do behavioral therapy modification we do we try this medication you know it's kind of a whole package because it's tough it's tough it'd be easy if we could just get a new bladder you know <laughs> but we can't, we can't do that I wish we could do that is that okay? Does that help your question? So, okay, male menopause. So, it menopause affects men as well as women. This is also commonly um, misunderstood. So, male menopause is decreased sex drive, loss of muscle mass, increased sleepiness, weakness, anxiety. This is many things that that you feel when you're you're at this age. Mood swings, depression. This is common, we actually know that it's related to hormonal imbalances. Um, and then related to, this is an interesting study that came out of uh, Harvard, and basically what this shows is that as you get older, there's erectile dysfunction that happens. And that this shows com complete, ED stands for erectile dysfunction, so complete, moderate, and minimal. So basically, as you go from 40 to 70, there's always going to be some erectile dysfunction that happens, regardless of, of why. So, it is true. Now, so this is the, the juicy stuff. Treatment of it, so we give agents by mouth. We can do injections, vacuum, um, and then we can actually put the prosthesis in. So that's for erectile dysfunction. And then urinary tract infections, they're very common. Um, and you know, other kind of comorbidities can cause these uh, problems as well. So it's just something to, to worry about. Uh, drink plenty of fluids. If it's in postmenopausal women, I put this in here because it's important to understand that as the hormones are reduced, that puts you at a higher risk of a urinary tract infection. So I see a lot of patients with what's called atrophic vaginitis, and we can simply treat that with the Premarin cream and decrease the amount in, of infection. So, I put that in there because that's also uh, something that is not w very well described um, by primary doctors. 
and cranberry extract, you know, and b bowel management. So not being constipated is very important um, for development of infections. I put, like, th there's only three more slides. Robotic surgery, this is the robot, because that's what my fellowship is in. This is what my passion is. So um, this is the robot. Not many people know what it actually looks like. We have to be in the same room. The surgeon sits here in the same room and, and drives this console right here. There's a couple of people that stay at the bedside. So it's very important um, surgery. surgery, huh? You have to have pretty good registration, don't you? You do, yeah, <laughs> you do. And um, these are the arms, some of the instruments. So it's precise, very precise surgery that we'd use for the prostate, for the kidney, for the bladder, um, and stones. And then basically just shows that stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I know it was fast, but.